Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Dominic, and I am the chair of the AIAA Public Policy Committee and Master of Ceremonies for the 2022 Durand Lecture for Public Service. This lecture emphasizes notable achievements by a scientific or technical leader whose contributions have led directly to the understanding and application of the science and technology of aeronautics ast and astronautics for the betterment of humanity. This lecture is named in the honor of Dr. William Durand, who was a US Naval officer and pioneer in mechanical engineering. During Dr. Durand's remarkable 99-year life, he contributed significantly to the development of aircraft propellers. He was the first civilian chair of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, the forerunner of NASA. The Institute's Public Policy Committee takes pride in selecting accomplished leaders in aeronautics and astronautics who can share their knowledge through the Durand Lecture. On behalf of AIAA, let me extend a heartfelt thank you to the Lockheed Martin Corporation. Their tradition of supporting this kind of discussion will drive our industry forward in our quest to evolve the technology and better understand the universe. Their incredibly generous sponsorship has made today's Durand Lecture possible. Now, to introduce our distinguished lecturer, please welcome Kirk Shireman, Vice President, Lunar Exploration Campaigns with the Lockheed Martin Corporation. Howdy. Um, first of all, it's a great, uh, a great honor and pleasure to be here uh, with you today to, to introduce our next uh, our speaker, William H. Bill Gerst Gerstenmeyer, Vice President Build and Flight Reliability from SpaceX. Bill's going to speak on a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart, human space flight, the ultimate team sport. Let me give you a little um, biography of uh, Bill Gerstenmeyer. Some of this I didn't know, and I've known Bill a long time. So. Um, uh, first of all, he's had an, in, in his current role with SpaceX, he leads SpaceX's quality engineering and process development teams and oversees launch readiness processes and serves as chief engineer on select missions. Prior to SpaceX, he served as associate administrator for human exploration and operations mission directorate at NASA headquarters. Bill began his career at NASA in 1977, then at the Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, he performed aeronautical research to develop and calibrate curves for the air data probes used on entry for the space shuttle. Throughout his next 40 years, Gerst oversaw numerous programs, including the Orbiter Orbital Maneuvering Vehicle, the OMV, the Space Shuttle, Space Station Freedom Assembly and Operations, Space Shuttle, space, or space shuttle Mir Program, integration, and of course the International Space Station before going on and taking his leadership role for, for HEO. Bill was named the NASA, the NASA Associate Administrator for Space Operations Directorate in 2005. He directed the completion of the last 21 space shuttle flights, which saw the completion of the International Space Station. Bill also orchestrated um, the transition from uh, from space shuttle to using commercial cargo services to, to service the International Space Station, commercial crew services to service the International Space Station. And he was also instrumental in uh, developing the contract for the commercial lunar planet, commercial lunar payload services contract, which shortly will land commercial payloads on the lunar surface. Bill studied at the U.S. Naval Academy before transferring to Purdue University, where he received his bachelor's degree in aeronautics and astronautics engineering with emphasis in propulsion. He continued his studies at the University of Toledo, receiving a master's degree in mechanical engineering and an honorary Ph.D. in astronautics and aeronautics engineering. And he was elected to the 2018 class of the National Academy of Engineering. He is a longtime member of AIAA and has been and being selected for the highest honor, an honorary fellow in 2013. So during his incredible career, Bill has impacted many of us along the way. He certainly has impacted me as a leader, a mentor, a colleague, and a friend. Um, Bill, I can, I can say I, I met Bill um, for the very first time in the late 1990s. 
I met him in a very unusual location. I met him at TGI Fridays, which doesn't sound that unusual uh, until you, uh, I tell you it was on Tverskaya Boulevard in Moscow, Russia. So I think Bill might be the only person I met in a TGI Fridays in Moscow. So, uh, Anyway, uh, and I've uh, known Bill ever since and been uh, and worked for him. In fact, even today, I still call him boss. Um, he's a great confidant, a great friend. Bill's an amazing individual. He's respected uh, around the world, and I can tell you this because I've traveled with Bill around the world. I've been privileged to do that. Uh, he's respected as a leader. He's respected as an engineer and respected as an individual around the world. Um, he's, uh, he's the kind of guy who... Can, uh, has a unique skills to go walk out of a congressional briefing, come outside and take my phone call, and we can talk about Fed hybrids, biocides. We can talk about bolt torques. We can talk about um, turbo pumps on uh, rocket engines. Uh, frankly, I think he enjoys those conversations more than the uh, congressional hearings. Um, well, he's taught me so many things, I couldn't tell you all the things he's taught me. I'm sure he'll tell you a bunch of those things. One of the things he taught me, though, I wanted to share with you is about goldfish moments. So if Gersh doesn't talk about it, please ask him afterwards. Tell him, uh, talk, ask, hey, Gersh, tell me about these goldfish moments, because uh, he really taught me to look for those through my career, through my life, and it's made a big difference. Before we begin the lecture here, we have a short video. We'd like to go ahead and roll with some comments from uh, your other friends and colleagues. Let's go ahead and roll the video. How can you contribute to this thing called human spaceflight? Lift off of space shuttle and lights. The mission to build, resupply, and to do research in the international space station. When I think about humans riding on the, the pointy end of a rocket, it is the absolute team activity. Gerstemeyer is supremely qualified to provide the Duran Lecture at the AIAA SciTech meeting. His many years of public service have shaped the human spaceflight program at NASA. Bill's impacts and contributions are myriad. Professional, personal, technical, programmatic, team building. It's fitting that he titled his lecture, Human Spaceflight, the Ultimate Team Support. That's so Bill. Exploration as a team sport could not be overstated. It is a group of individuals all working for a common goal, and you have taught us that. You have exemplified that through your leadership. You have exemplified that through your day-to-day -day efforts. Love your leadership. Really appreciate all the mentoring you did for me, and it was just really great to be part of your orbit as you, as you ran through your career at NASA and what you're doing now post-NASA. It's his dedication to the future of humanity expressed in many ways, but particularly in his absolute commitment to the next generation of scientists, explorers, and engineers that has always struck me the most. First and I spent an afternoon with middle school students from the south side of Chicago at the Museum of Science and Industry. They were so excited about human space flight and they were asking us questions about how we had gotten to where we were in our careers and how they could emulate that in pursuing their education. Over the course of his career, Bell's had a huge impact on our nation's spaceflight programs. From the early days of the International Space Station with our Russian colleagues and our other international partners for how we were going to operate the space station program, up to his most recent engagement at headquarters as the Human Spaceflight Lead. Congratulations, Bill, on this great honor. Um, so well deserved. I've known you for a long time, and, and your dedication to spaceflight not only just human, but exploration as well through your work on, on the ISS, through your work in the Space Shuttle, and even the, the work you've done trying to get commercial crew, commercial cargo started for us uh, as a nation. Just incredible work you've done. Bill wrote me once in an email, Human spaceflight points to an optimistic future for humanity, and he epitomizes this. During early space station assembly, uh, Gersten and I worked together behind the scenes. It was so hard to do research. There was so little time, so few resources. But he would take my advice. If there was something that we could do just a little differently to make an opportunity for the science to be better, if it was within his power, he would make it happen. You were the global leader for human spaceflight. And when I was there, I couldn't appreciate that more. So congratulations, my friend. Um, 
Well deserved and best wishes. Whether it's at SpaceX or NASA, at his alma mater at Purdue University, at conferences, at international space agencies, no matter how busy he may be, I have never known him to pass up the opportunity to reach out and mentor young professionals. And I just want to say personally, Gers, from my perspective, I cannot say thank you enough for what you have taught me, what you have taught all of us, and your leadership for human exploration, and your leadership in getting us into the transition to lead to the new commercial space opportunity. You have been a fantastic AIAA member, long-standing AIAA member. Your awards with the Goddard Award, the Program Management Awards, your honorary fellow, which is extremely well-deserved, and all of your efforts, you are a shining example of what the Duran Lectureship should be. And we just want to say thank you and how much we appreciate everything you have done for us. One more thing, Durst. Boiler up. Now, please join me in welcoming our distinguished lecturer to present the 2022 Duran Lecture for Public Service, Bill Gerstenmeyer. Well, thank you. Um, after all that, I don't know what to say. <clears throat> I know the real me, and it, that's not the real me. So you can forget all that. And, and I thought what I'd do today is I'm going to reflect back on the history of human spaceflight. And I, and I think there's a very different impression we get as we look back on the major events of the past. You know, we know the outcome today, and that changes the way we look back at the events that occurred in the past. And what I want us to do today is to look at some of those events that occurred in the past but look at them at the time when they occurred, when there was uncertainty associated with the path and the outcome was unknown and when the decisions were made. Don't look back at the event or the activity and, and then think and build a story based on what you see today. Actually put yourself back in the time when those decisions were made and then kind of go forward with that uncertainty and I think that helps us move forward. You know, human space flight's a tremendously challenging endeavor Designing and operating hardware that will launch your friends into the harsh environment is one of the most demanding tasks that we can have. Facing the challenge cannot be accomplished alone. We must work together and openly discuss what we know and what we do not know. No one person alone can understand all the aspects. No one person can have the knowledge or the skills that are needed to launch humans into space. We must work together as a team. And I see human spaceflight as the ultimate team sport. Human spaceflight is all about and and not or. It is not about robotic missions or human spaceflight missions. It is not about a national program or an international program. It is not about a government program nor a private sector program. It is not about abandoning Earth and leaving the Earth for future destinations or planets. It is about using the challenge of exploring and settling new worlds to learn new strategies to better protect our home planet. Human spaceflight is about doing all of these things together, and it demands that we all work together. The benefit to humanity is that, as the Apollo astronauts stated, we came all the way to the moon to learn more about the Earth. Learning to live off planet will help us better to live on the Earth. As the astronauts at the International Space Station came to say, off the Earth, for the Earth. The demands for using limited resources in space will provide new technologies and, and for utilizing the resources of the Earth. Human spaceflight requires the best of all of us in working together. So what I want to do now is go back and kind of talk about the history of, of human spaceflight. And I think we often think of Apollo as the model for the future. I was not working during the Apollo program, but I did get to work with many of the human spaceflight leaders and program managers from that time. Apollo was very unique in time and motivation, 
And we need to be super careful as we look back at Apollo as the model for the future. Apollo was possibly a one-off event with many unique events aligning to allow Apollo to occur. As this chart shows, Apollo was very short in duration and focused on one goal, US astronauts to the moon. Once this goal was achieved, the motivation for continued human exploration vanished and human spaceflight went into decline. This decline was in spite of the many scientific achievements that were accomplished through Apollo. Those of us who looked to explore saw Apollo as a great accomplishment, an example of what we can do if we work together. Others saw this as too risky, too costly, and not sustainable. As my mentors used to say, Apollo was ordinary people getting to do extraordinary things. They felt privileged to be allowed to work on the huge challenge of, of Apollo. They, saw, they and others saw the benefit of Apollo as a source of unlimited optimism and the power of working together. If we can land humans on the moon and safely return them to Earth, we can do anything. This statement is often used today without any reflection on the cost or risk associated with achieving this outcome. Several things made Apollo truly unique in a one-time event. Apollo was devised as a political activity to show democracy was superior to communism. We needed to beat the Russians to show that democracy was superior. Von Braun wrote a letter to the Vice President of the United States outlining outlining the options and things we could do in space. This letter effectively compared the US rocket capability to the Russian capability at the time. The letter compares objectives that could be accomplished in space and each country's ability to achieve these objectives. The letter states that the only activity in space where we had a good chance of beating the Russians was landing a crew on the moon and returning them safely to Earth. The letter is a fascinating and accurately captures our capability at the time and lays out the framework for the Apollo program. The reason that we could, we could potentially beat the Russians to a crewed lunar landing was because both the Soviets and the US lacked a heavy lift rocket capability for the task. This letter is well worth reading and if you get a chance to go to the internet, you should read the entire letter that Von Braun wrote. It really lays out extremely well the the process at the time of Apollo. President Kennedy reflected on the challenges of the goal in his famous speech, we do hard things. He also did not overspecify the objectives of the goal. He did not specify the how, as we often do today in requirements, but stayed with the objectives, land safely and return within a specific time frame. He left the detailed implementation up to the engineers. Today's congressional legislation often spells out lift capabilities or specific vehicles or techniques to be used. That's not the right approach. We need to stay with just the basics of what needs to be done and not the how. The Von Braun letter also calls out Apollo as basically needing a wartime effort. And, and in that sense, that's exactly what Apollo became. We needed to beat the Russians at all costs. Funds were provided for the, for the whole of industry, and the whole of industry was committed. There was not a concern about making profit, but the industry saw this as a wartime effort, and industry was united in its accomplishments and the goals to, or, to achieve Apollo. When Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, Johnson saw the moon effort as a way to honor Kennedy's legacy and doubled his effort to keep the program going. The goal was not only to beat the Russians, but to honor a fallen president. If Kennedy would have remained alive, he may, may have seen the cost and sacrifices of a lunar program as too great and looked for a compromised approach, such as cooperating with the Russians or lowering the funding. Johnson, on the other hand, saw the Apollo program as even more important with the legacy implications to Kennedy. After we landed on the moon and even before we landed on the moon, plans were in work to stop the Apollo program. The program was seen as too costly and risky. Apollo 13 drove home that risk. I argue that Apollo was unique and effectively a wartime effort and not a sustainable model for human spaceflight. Apollo is often cited as the model for human spaceflight. I disagree. The systems engineering review process we use today is modeled, after, modeled off of Apollo. 
This approach works well for a win-at-all-cost government-led process, but a more agile process in systems development might be more appropriate today. Apollo had to develop a lot of new infrastructure and face many technical challenges. The rigorous systems approach supported that effort, but new, leaner, agile approaches might be better today. Apollo benefited very much from the Langley team that came to the Johnson Space Center to work in flight design and operations. Their experience in flight test was key to Apollo. The flight test philosophy and rapid learning was key to Apollo and might have had a stronger influence than the systems engineering approach. We need to be very careful and not blindly follow or hope for Apollo to be the model for human spaceflight. Now we'll talk a little bit about the shuttle program. There was about a five year gap between Apollo and a shuttle, between Apollo and shuttle. This gap was filled with the Apollo Soyuz program in 1975, Skylab in 1973 through 74, Skylab reentered in 1979. This was a very tough period for NASA. There were many layoffs and the lack of direction on, where, on what NASA was to do next. I was hired in 1977 by NASA at the then Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Only two people were hired that year, and no one was hired for about five years previous to that time. When I came on board, my mentors at the center carefully crafted my job description such that I would not be immediately laid off. The time after Apollo was traumatic for the agency and for human spaceflight. The shuttle program was to be the answer to Apollo. We needed an affordable, highly reliable launch system. Reusability was key to the shuttle. Reliability was also highly important. There would be no separate abort system for shuttle. There were abort modes, such as return to landing site or transatlantic abort, but no separate abort system. The early shuttle program leaders saw the problems of an all expendable Apollo program and knew that something different had to be developed. High fly rate was very important. The shuttle had a huge technical challenges. These challenges included a thermal protection system that would be reusable on the orbiter and the entry vehicle, a new high specific impulse engine, the ability to fly hypersonic region of the upper atmosphere and land on a runway. The engines were carried on the shuttle for return and reuse with center of gravity impacts to the orbiter and a need for propellants to flow through the shuttle into the engines themselves. This created two large holes in the orbiter heat shield that had to be sealed prior to reentry. These were huge technical challenges and required tremendous innovation. The shuttle was scheduled originally to fly in the mid to late 70s, but it flew for the first time in April of 1981. The computer system with five computers and voting logic were unique at the time. The pilot to computer interface was also new. The shuttle program underestimated the work associated with these technical development areas, and development was delayed and compromises were required. The shuttle was originally to have liquid flyback boosters rather than solid rocket motors, but the shuttle program was also to be the sole launch system for the United States and fly all civil, commercial, and military payloads. This was to enable a high flight rate and reduced cost per flight for the shuttle system. The shuttle was to be more than a launch vehicle. It was designed to have a crew airlock, um, a ability to be a, uh, have a spacewalk capability, and a robotic arm. The shuttle was to be an in-space service platform for spacecraft and an assembly platform for a future space station. The standard payload interface that the shuttle developed was also brand new. I worked on several wind tunnel projects at Lewis for the shuttle and got to collect data in a Lewis 10 by 10 foot supersonic wind tunnel. The purpose was to capture aerodynamic data at Mach three and a half and below on a subscale shuttle model. This included all the components of the shuttle, the orbiter, the external tank, and the solid rocket motors. I also got to assist in collecting data for the air data probe systems that were used for entry as Kirk described earlier. I used to have an, a poster in my office titled Going to Work in Space with the shuttle in the background. The shuttle was to show that space was a place where humans could go and work. The shuttle accomplished this goal. In 1980, I transferred to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and began to work as a propulsion flight controller. I was on console for the first flight of Columbia and in the back room for the first shuttle flight. Flying crew 
John Young and Bob Crippen on the first flight of the vehicle was a huge challenge. I used to jog with Bob and John at, at lunch, and I considered them my friends. All systems needed to be ready and tested to the maximum extent possible. This was not a test, fail, learn approach. At the time, I did not realize the criticality of the success required for this mission. A mission of this type today would likely be seen as too risky to put two humans on board the vehicle for this first test flight. The Apollo leaders at the time saw this flight as much less risky than Apollo, and therefore it was acceptable. As a new engineer, I didn't know any better. I followed my leaders. And I saw this as a challenge, but a doable with acceptable risk and, and really not too risky. In hindsight, I see it very differently. There were many things on this flight that could not be tested adequately on the ground, and this was really a true test flight. The shuttle program is viewed by many as too costly and not effective. The shuttle is sometimes remembered by Challenger and the Columbia disasters. I see the program in a very different way. The shuttle was a tremendously versatile work platform. The program showed us the value of reusability, and it opened up the idea of working in space as being a reality. The benefits and legacy of the 30-year history of the shuttle is often overlooked. The shuttle flew 135 flights and did an amazing number of special missions, including the Hubble deploy, including the Hubble deploy mission, the repair mission, and sending astronauts as well as commercial satellites and, and repairing not only commercial satellites with crew members and, and returning satellites back into space. Prior to Challenger, the shuttle program was starting to achieve many of the original design objectives. The Challenger loss was a tremendous setback. As head of the shuttle robotically deployed payloads group at the time of the loss, the loss was tremendous. We not only failed as engineers, but we lost friends on the crew. I personally knew many of the crew members and the loss was devastating. It's unimaginable at the time that, that we could have such a failure. There were many articles and studies written on the loss and I don't want to repeat them today. And I promised myself after Challenger that I would never allow another tragedy like this to occur again. Yet I was in the International Space Station as program manager when the Columbia tragedy occurred. These losses were devastating, both professionally and personally. We should never take for granted the risks associated with human spaceflight. The risks are real and ever present, and we should do everything possible to be prepared. This requires a total team effort. Openly sharing our weaknesses and helping each other. Every member of the team must know that human lives are at risk we too often focus on the risk, but we do not look at the benefits. The benefits are inspiration and working at the performance level unknown in other activities. June Scobie Rogers lost her husband as commander on Challenger. She dedicated her life to letting children experience and know the types and joys of human spaceflight, science and technology by starting the Challenger Center for Students. Her husband knew the risk of human space flights, and to honor him, she wanted to share his passion with the next generation of space explorers. Our business is demanding and hard, but the benefits of working together are immeasurable. At the time of Challenger, the commercial satellite market was effectively paying for the shuttle program costs. Operational limits were being improved and reusability was becoming efficient. However, after Challenger, the program became extremely conservative and added additional tests and checkouts. These tests and checkouts could not be removed later, even if the benefit was found to be minimal. The turnaround time became longer and very complicated. Commercial launches were prohibited from shuttle flights and the military restarted the expendable launch program. Effectively, the key goals, reusability, and high flight rate enabling low cost per flight planned for the shuttle programs were lost. The shuttle went on to accomplish many amazing things, including the assembly of the International Space Station, the largest in-space structure ever assembled. There's a lot to be learned from the shuttle. Having another vehicle without crew to test new systems could be extremely important. An uncrewed shuttle could have been used to increase learning, and it would have been extremely beneficial. A cargo shuttle C version was studied, but never implemented. 
Now we'll move a little bit to the International Space Station and talk about it. Space Station is enabling a future for the private sector and non-government crews to experience space. The Space Station program is made up of 16 partner countries. Each country contributed modules and capabilities for the exploration of space. Countries, as part of their contribution, obtained usage rights based on their contributions. They also got astronaut opportunities based on their contribution. The partners agreed to a no exchange of funds basis of operations and used barter for the development. The station did not have the technical complexity of the shuttle program, but it had management complexity, international negotiations, and the scale of assembly was huge. 37 shuttle flights were required to build the space station. As the shuttle was retired, NASA chose the private sector to provide services for both cargo and crew transportation to the International Space Station. The shuttle was not needed as the station assembly was complete, but more routine services were required to keep the station operating. The acquisition of these services was done in a different way than in the past. NASA decided to buy services and not own the vehicle design. Failure and loss of cargo was acceptable. Flying cargo first allowed the private sector to fail and learn before taking on the task of transporting the precious cargo crew. NASA's approach to acquiring services allowed the private sector to open space exploration to a broader segment of the population. This was transformative. The private sector must now figure out how to develop new markets for space exploration independent of the government. All of this was enabled by the space station being an anchor tenant and allowing the private sector to grow. The station is still active and can serve as the catalyst for innovation. NASA's approach to services allowed the launch industry to be transformed for all government customers. SpaceX took this step a step further by developing Starlink satellites to allow underserved users access to the internet. SpaceX is tapping an established market, internet services, with its satellites and launch service capability. Starlink launches allow SpaceX to keep learning without risking crew or another customer's payload. The goal of the ISS is to transition into a series of private space stations serving the needs of a commercial market. The private sector must develop this commercial market. As you can see in the chart, the duration of the shuttle program and the ISS program are much longer than Apollo. There's been a much better transition from program to program than there was from Apollo to shuttle. As I look to the future, I show Starship, but there's also the Artemis program of lunar exploration. NASA has the Space Launch System and Orion spacecraft scheduled to fly an uncrewed flight to the moon this year, hopefully in March. Likewise, SpaceX is scheduled to fly its heavy lift launch vehicle on an orbital test flight in the next several weeks or months. NASA also has underway the Lunar Gateway program. SpaceX saw the need for a heavy lift reusable launch vehicle and is building Starship. Starship will be part of the human landing system used to take crews back to the moon. It's exciting to see the private sector contribute directly to development of systems needed for human exploration. Starship will stage out of low Earth orbit with a heavy, heavy reliance on refueling capability. I'll not touch much more about the future as others are developing the current plans for exploration. And kind of in conclusion, human spaceflight is not easy and it requires extreme teamwork and willingness to keep learning. When we take for granted and assume everything is okay or stop looking at the data, we get in trouble. We must not just fix the immediate concern, but dig deeper and understand the root cause. If a requirement is being routinely violated, dig deeper and see if the environment causing the discrepant condition can be certified or qualified or the hardware redesigned. For example, if an area of thermal protection is routinely being damaged by normal processing and the damage is routinely minor and approved for each flight, look carefully at the requirements. How much margin loss does the damage cause? Can the part be recertified for all environments? And what are the specific level of the damage that can be tolerated? Can a guard be put in place such that the damage doesn't occur? Can a more damage tolerant type of thermal protection be developed? By going above and beyond the immediate concern or just clearing the initial condition for flight, 
you're preventing future, possibly more severe, severe problems. Just clearing the problem creates an attitude that could lead to future unacceptable conditions. This might take extra time, but creating this attitude of understanding risk and margin is critical to sustained flight. Overreact to small problems or close calls. These close calls are a gift. They're truly a gift and we need to learn from those close calls. As I look back on human spaceflight and project forward, it looks like we're at another transition point. We are transitioning to a phase where the private sector can play a larger role in human spaceflight. International involvement is available and required. Reusability, first explored with the shuttle, is again being explored. Can the hard lessons learned from shuttle be effectively applied to Starship? Can the government exploration systems, SLS and Orion, be effectively combined with the private sector and the international systems? It is clear there are new ways of exploring and the lunar science missions planned this year will help us to understand the availability and usability of lunar resources. Learning to, re le learning to use resources on the moon and other planets will be critical to moving human presence into the solar system. The private sector use and market is developing in low Earth orbit and it promises to offload some of the funding required from the government. This is an, indeed an exciting time. It will be exciting to watch human spaceflight team grow, learn, and do even more amazing things. The risks will always be present, no matter how well we attempt to control them. We are very lucky to be ordinary folks, being allowed and challenged to do extraordinary things. We are part of an amazing team. Science and technology underpins all of the work in human spaceflight. Here's to an exciting 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for, for such a meaningful presentation. Uh, I know uh, seeing some of the questions come through on the, on the chat, uh, there, there's some, some really good discussions going on. Um, <clears throat> on behalf of uh, the AWA Public Policy Committee and uh, the Lockheed Martin Corporation, I'd like to present to you now the Duran Certificate and, and Medal, recognizing you for this award. We'll go ahead and take some questions, um, continue with the questions and answer in, this, in the chat. If For those of you that are uh, online, there should be a Q&A button uh, next to the, uh, the panel that you can click. And for those of you in the audience, go ahead and submit questions through the app. And uh, I'll take them now and uh, have a quick chat with Bert, Gers. So, Bill, one of the first questions that, that's come up is uh, regarding the perception with human spaceflight that uh, Apollo, shuttle, ISS might be considered wasteful expenditures. Um, while military programs such as the F-35, KC-46, are, they're far more expensive, they don't tend to get the same negative scrutiny, certainly in the, in the public press. Why do you think that is, and, and, and how would you compare and contrast those types of programs? You know, again, kind of as I, I talked about in my remarks, I think everybody sees the expenses of these activities and the human spaceflight things, and, but they don't look at the benefit side. And the benefits are, are hard to quantify, right? They're, they're almost emotional, right? They're the inspiration aspect that I described to you. Um, I don't know how you put a value on that, right? But, but we kind of want to have a, a, a way to compare and, and contrast the value, but you, but you can't put a value on inspiration. You know, as I said in my, in my speech, you know, Apollo really changed the way we think of what we can accomplish, right? Is there, if you can, you know, you can look up at the night sky and you can see the moon and you can recognize that's a long way away. You can also recognize that somebody's sitting next to you in the audience. We're gonna put people on that little body and they're gonna walk around and they're gonna drive cars and they're gonna dig underground 
and whatever, you can understand the complexity, you can understand the, the challenge of that, then that gets translated into, if I can do this activity, if we can pull together as a human species and we can do this activity, is there anything we can't accomplish? And how do you put a price tag on that inspiration? And yes, in dollars and cents, it's expensive. Should we be spending money on other things or better things? I don't know. But I think that sense of optimism is really important to us. And I think that's why young people tend to, tend to gravitate towards space and to technology and to science and those things, because there's, sense, there's a sense of a better future for us all. So thinking about now towards um, uh, the move towards commercial payload and, and the use of commercial space flight and commercial companies to service the International Space Stations, how did your perspective on commercial payload services change after you left the government going from a uh, customer to a supplier? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't, when I was on the government side, um, again, as a classic engineer, right, you have to have a plan A and a plan B. So we chose multiple providers for cargo, multiple providers for crew. And then now I'm on the private sector side and, and presently, right now, there's only one, one crew uh, transportation capability available. Boeing will come along here pretty soon. But I, but I feel, uh, I would say, uh, the responsibility that I see in SpaceX of providing this transportation capability for the nation is uh, pretty impactful to me personally. And, and the pressure on us is, is no short of, of, of huge. And so I think I, I see on the other side is I might not have appreciated how much, um, how much uh, I guess, pressure we place on these private sector companies to go take over these tasks and do these things looking forward. Whereas I saw it maybe more as a contractual thing and I didn't see the ownership on the other side. But, but that same spirit of that same team effort of working together is still is still there on both sides. So I think it's been it's been really fascinating for me to be on both sides and get a chance to kind of play different roles on the same team doing the same kind of objectives. And it, I've been I've been tremendously blessed throughout my career. I mean, I would say all these things that you know you you got to see and, and hear about my career. If it wasn't for my wife and family tolerating me and, and letting me go do these crazy things, I wouldn't even be here. So. I mean, I just look back and I just think how blessed I was to get to go do these things. And, and what, the Apollo, what the Apollo folks said, you know, ordinary people getting to do extraordinary things. I mean, these were amazing people. These were Gene Kranz, really? these were Steve Bales, these were Gene, Gene, uh, Gene Kranz and Chris Kraft and, and all those folks. And, and they were really, really humbled and they just felt that they were lucky to get to be in this business and, and hopefully we all get a chance to feel how our small little piece can contribute to the bigger goals of what we're trying to accomplish. So as a follow-up to that, um, thinking about the teamwork arrangement, what's, the, what's been the teamwork like between uh, the government customer and the private sector for some of these commercial activities? Are there things that uh, the commercial companies are better suited to do that uh, government uh, is unable to do or unwilling to do? Um, or vice versa? How would you characterize that? You know, I think in the, in the case of the private sector, we can take some more risk for like cargo missions and, and other things where um, the government can't. So like with the Starlink satellites, their, their SpaceX Starlink, Starlink satellites, if we lose 40 or 50 of those, it's a bad day, but it's not the end of the world. So we can now try maybe a new propellant loading scheme. We can try a different computer architecture on that mission, make sure that it really works before we then go commit it to a government mission that has to work or has to, has to perform. I think in the government world, the expectation is everything is gonna be successful. There's not an ability to, to fail, test, and learn. And I think if you go back and look at Apollo, they learned a lot on every flight. There were numerous failures on every flight. Things didn't go exactly well the way they were planned. In hindsight, we see those as all being kind of one success after another. We don't see that, that flight test philosophy and that flight test mentality. But I think the private sector can do that flight test experiment, uh, learn, grow, learn, fail, and grow uh, and much better than maybe the government can at that time. So they can iterate a lot faster then ultimately in the designs. But, but then I think some of the technology really needs to come from the, from the government side. Some of the technology makes no sense to be investing in. The private sector doesn't see any return on investment. So developing you know, hypersonic code or computational fluid dynamics or new structural stuff or new composite materials, 
um, new ways of fabricating things, that's probably the role for the government to, to expend resources and money on doing that, that high, high level research. I think the, the cool thing about NASA is they not only expended in the research, but they also had a mission objective too. And I think that kept NASA grounded very well. So that's another thing is that NASA can't be just a pure research organization. They need to be an applied research organization where the things they're studying can have some potential future application. But that being done by the government then handed off to the private sector is extremely effective. So is that where things such as Space Act agreements and, and cooperative research and development agreements come into play to be able to help spur that, that the relationship between the government and industry? Yeah, I think there's a tremendous benefit of the Space Act agreements and, and things that can, can occur. You know, I would say, for example, like on the parachutes, we had some material come off uh, during one of our uh, SpaceX return flights and the material went up and, and hit, a, hit one of the drogue chutes and damaged the drogue chute. Uh, we were able to actually extract the material from the drogue chute very quickly, understand what the material was, and then NASA was able to actually take that into a high-velocity gun and actually fire it at the material and duplicate wow. and replicate. So that is a nice relationship between what the government can do, where they have access to test facilities that we would not have access to in the SpaceX, but then SpaceX world, but the SpaceX world can be very fast in producing products and giving those resources to the government to then go use and go test in their in their application. So I think that, that taking this ultimate teamwork thing, right. is how do you take the best, what naturally occurs in the two avenues, and I would include academia as well, I yep. would include universities and students, the same thing, take those different aspects and what you can contribute. Don't downplay what you contribute, but look to see how you can contribute and bring something else to the, else to the uh, activity that you're trying to do forward. And then that's the team sport activity. I, I often hear like small countries like Peru would tell me they didn't have anything to contribute to spaceflight. I disagree with that. They don't have the same biases that we have. They have a different way of looking at things. They can reach out to their people. They may have a different way of communicating that's actually more beneficial. So, so you know, celebrate the diversity, look for unique ways, look for different ways to bring that team together, but don't discount what you can bring to the party. Don't ever assume that you don't have enough capability that you can contribute something. Figure out what's missing from that team and figure out how you can add and contribute in the area that you can contribute in. That's great advice. So, so what is being done to capture lessons learned when developing space systems emissions to avoid uh, some of the disasters that occurred with, with Challenger or Columbia and, and put that towards future system development? You know, again, I, you know, I, I, I think about this all the time. How could I have prevented Columbia? And, and I think it's what I tried to say in my remarks is when a close call occurs and some small event occurs, don't just clear it for the next flight. Really dig deeper and, and really understand what's going on. You know, we, we, we were losing foam on the first shuttle flight. The piece of foam hit the Ohms pod. My job was to be on the fourth team to go look at, could we return safely the first shuttle flight, Columbia, with this damage to the Ohms pod? And we did some analysis and we thought, yeah, it should be okay. But then we kind of just forgot about that and said, okay, it's fine. But we never really studied when was it important that foam came off. And, and we think we got to where foam just hitting the bottom of the orbiter was fine because it was hitting at a glancing blow. I don't think we really looked at foam hitting the wing leading edge. And we never really calculated, you know, one half mv squared and looked at the kinetic energy. It turns out there's a tremendous velocity differential for a 20 second window during, uh, during ascent. When a piece of foam comes off, it accelerates to over 700 to 800 feet per second. Wow. And so it doesn't matter how light that foam is, when it impacts perpendicular to an object, it has enough force it can damage or crack the wing. I don't think it was as bad as Southwest Research showed where they actually blew a hole in the wing. I believe we just probably cracked the wing, the reinforced carbon-carbon, but it was not well, envisioned no. at the time that reinforced carbon-carbon would ever crack, and let alone could a little piece of lightweight foam cause that. But we didn't dig deep enough. We didn't look at that, that equation. We didn't look at one half mv squared. We didn't look at the velocity. We didn't look at that 20 second vulnerability window and we didn't analyze that. So as I look back, it's when you're given a small problem and it seems inconsequential, your tendency is okay, put it aside, we'll work on it later. 
I think you need to overreact to that a little bit and spend a little bit extra time off to the side and dig a little bit deeper and look a little bit harder to see if you can discover, is there something I can learn from this? Because I, I truly believe those are gifts from God. You are given a close call for a reason. You need to learn from that close call and you need to put it into practice. Uh, you know, there's a book, Anti-Fragile. It's about not just being resistance to failure, but it's actually learning and growing from failure. So small little failures, like when you exercise and you hurt your muscles, they're actually building stronger and getting stronger your muscles. We need to be the same way with our problems that come up. When a little small problem comes up, it's not a big deal to you, but can you learn from that that you actually make the system more robust, make the system stronger? And can you learn from that in a positive way? So those are things that I, I think I've learned through my career to, to move forward. We had a, we had a case in a spacesuit where an astronaut got uh, the, essentially the water, the cooling system leaked into the air system on the spacesuit and filled the, uh, the astronaut's helmet full of water. And, and I kind of overreacted to that and I formed a formal investigation board and whatever. And, and I did that purposely just to make sure we would learn as much as we could from that activity. And what we had seen on the ground was any time water got into the air loop, it would stall the pump because the pump couldn't pump the water around, the air pump couldn't pump the water around, it would actually stall. But in zero gravity, it turns out, the fluid would whisk around the pump, not actually overload the pump, and it would allow the air pump to continue to circulate and run, but still would allow this water to then flow into the helmet, such we had this case where we were essentially you know, flooding the helmet with water. So I was able to look at that <coughs> and determine that not only applied to EVA suits, but it applied to thermal systems because we had the same thing on thermal pumps. We assumed that they would stall if water ever got into them, and it was not the case. So we were able to take that learning and broaden that to many more disciplines and, and learn from that in, in a positive way. So those are the kind of things that I think they don't seem intuitive, and they seem like you're spending an extra time that you don't need to spend, but you need to spend that extra time. So you mentioned how our system engineering approach is kind of based uh, on the uh, existing, uh, what was developed during the Apollo days, um, is this, does that need to change then to, to adopt uh, improved learning approaches to, to address some of these failure systems? Or how would you adjust the, the system engineering approach we use today to better capture or better, better look in advance for these types of failure modes? I think if you look at the software industry, they use an approach called Agile. Um, and I think we can adapt some of that in our systems today where we maybe don't no need to define all the requirements to the level that we do today when we do a systems requirements review and a preliminary design review and a critical design review. Can we maybe, maybe not have all those requirements defined but actually go into the design, actually build some of the hardware itself and then see what properties naturally are easily achievable, what are not there and do they meet the requirements? Because I don't think sometimes the user fully understands all the requirements, but we tend to want to specify all those requirements, and then we spend a lot of time verifying and analyzing, can we meet those requirements? I think there's a way where you actually do requirements development in parallel with design, and that's part of this agile process. That'd be great, because there's an awful lot of NASA standards out there that I know we've, we've, we've struggled with over the years. <laughs> and so I think, again, that's the trick, is to find that right level. I think there's clearly some programs where you need the more rigorous approach, but then there's other ones where you need, need a, a faster approach. Oh, that's great advice. So when, when you're looking at um, uh, the learning from shuttle, and you want to look towards a multi-use vehicle, because so shuttle certainly was a multi-use vehicle, uh, what kind of advice do you have uh, learning from that program for the folks that are working on Starship, for instance, or, or the new Dragon or, or CST-100 uh, for Starship for, for Boeing? Yeah, I think, again, you know, if you look at where we are with, with where Boeing is and where um, SpaceX is with uh, Dragon, we have a separate abort system for Ascent. Um, again, Starship is going to go back, potentially carrying crew at some point without a separate abort system. So that reliability that needed to be there in shuttle with like abort modes like transatlantic abort or return to landing site, that's going to have to come back in some way, shape, or form, or we're going to have to add some kind of system to Starship to provide an independent uh, escape capability for the crew, and, and we're going to have to make some decisions about that up front, or be more transparent about what those risks are up front and be willing to accept those risks of, of going forward. I think the other advantage will be the fact that Starship will get to do a lot of refueling flights to carry propellant to low Earth orbit. Um, 
And just that high flight rate allows you a chance to learn. You know, I see that very much like in the Russian program where they had the progress vehicles and then the Soyuz crew vehicles. They would typically always put um, a new system on the progress vehicles and fly it several times before sense, they yeah. then put it on top of a crew vehicle where, where it was absolutely critical to operate. We were able to do the same things like I described in SpaceX with Starlink flights. We'll test all new hardware, all new systems, all new procedures on the Starlink flights where we can tolerate the failure or learn from the failure. And then when it comes time for crew where that failure is not there. So I think that kind of learning and that kind of approach can be very, very applicable. I think it's also good to look outside the aerospace industry, look at the auto industry and what they're doing, look at the aircraft industry and how they handle these things. Again, I think Apollo benefited tremendously from the flight test philosophy that came from the Langley engineers that they went down to the Johnson Space Center at the time. And, and that same kind of cross-discipline area, I think, is another ripe area to, to learn. Yeah, I've often thought, uh, looking towards the auto industry, for instance, as an example, they don't reinvent the internal combustion engine every time they want to make a, a new car. So um, what, what lessons can we learn from that iterative approach and apply those to our spacecraft mentality? Because it seems like every time we want to go to space, we're always developing a brand new vehicle. Is there other things that we can do to be more iterative in our approach that, so that we can uh, accomplish things more quickly? Yeah, I think, again, there's some advantages of looking at that, to how to move things forward or how maybe even the approach we were on is not the right approach and to be not afraid to disruptively innovate and go in a totally different, different fashion. Um, you know, I think today um, Starlink is very unique in the fact that we have about uh, 15,000 to 18,000 satellites in orbit. Um, those satellites are not, each individual satellite can tolerate a failure and it's not a big deal because the way it works is as your antenna, your KU phased array on top of your house, it tracks multiple satellites that are coming overhead. So loss of a single satellite doesn't mean loss of internet to your house. It just means you've lost that one satellite. So it's not a precious resource like a large geosynchronous telecommunications satellite is today. So is there another approach where almost in a sense these satellites can be a disposable asset that they can be used and learn and they're not an investment for a lifetime? And, I, and again, I don't know the right, the right mix and the right mm -hmm. answers. There's, there's things that truly require unique one-of-a-kind things like JWST to go back and look at the, at the dawn of the Big Bang. You really need an instrument that is probably that complicated and that sophisticated to accomplish that. That couldn't be accompli accomplished with another smaller spacecraft. But some of the stuff we're doing now in low Earth orbit and medium Earth orbit with multiple satellites, I think there's a different approach there that, that might have beneficial uh, aspects. It was interesting, Earth science used to always have their satellites in the, um, essentially they called it the A-train, where they would come over the Earth at the same time of day, the same time of solar day each day so they could get good data. And then when the space station was in a different inclination where it wasn't over this phase repeating orbit where the time of day of passage was different. They didn't want to put sensors on board space station, but then they put them on board space station. Now all of a sudden they got to see CO2 generation at different times of day than they saw before. They got to see a different uh, aspect and it actually brought another piece of information to them that they had not ever expected to see. Wow. It actually allowed them to do things differently. So I think the, the message here is just because we did it one way before, and this is the standard way, look for other ways to do things. And, and also be super careful with what I tell you, right? This is my experience, this is my <laughs> bias, right? You should never trust some old guy in a red sweater <laughs> on some stage. Unless he's got a big beard and a hat with his bell on top, yeah, right? Yeah, exp <laughs> espousing wisdom. Forget it, challenge what I'm saying. I, I wanna be challenged and let's look for new ways. Let's figure out ways to get creative. Let's bring in the best and the brightest. Let's be this ultimate team that I described and figure out ways to work together. So thinking about the ultimate team, uh, a lot of our uh, exploration programs now are very heavily uh, weighted towards international partnerships and cooperation between those international entities is, is really important. Um, it's traditionally been bound though by treaties and agreements on utilization of space for payloads. Uh, as you get more introduction of private interests in space that aren't necessarily bound or accommodated by those, how do you, how do you address using those same agreements and, and what policy issues do you foresee having to need to be resolved between nation to nation and private and national 
co cooperation. Certainly you saw that with some of the, the, the recent um, anti-satellite tests that are going on and, and or, or certainly as, as commercial uh, LEO gets populated by more commercial spacecraft, how do we need to manage that, uh, those activities amongst those parties? Again, I think you need to look at the benefits that you get from the team, teammate you're bringing on the team, and then how can you use them. You know, I described in my remarks about the barter arrangement with Space Station. That was really good because there was no exchange of funds between any of the countries. All the money was spent internal to the United States to build the US modules. All the European modules were built in Europe with European euros being spent to those. Um, the Japanese modules were built in Japan using uh, Japanese uh, yen to, to actually go ahead and, and, and fund the development of that hardware. But then we exchanged services back and forth amongst each other, and that was tremendously beneficial. I don't think industry liked that because then they weren't able to bring new business in from foreign countries and other places. But the advantage was that these they could sell these government programs that this money is being spent in your is being spent in Europe, it's being spent in the US, it's being spent in Japan. So I think we need to look for clever ways of putting these things together. We also need to be very careful about when we put policy in place. It takes a long time to get a policy in place and then once it's there, it's really hard to get that policy out and we need to be super careful we don't put those things in place. You know, if, if Kennedy would have told us we needed to go to the moon, the way it was originally envisioned, we were going to build one big, large rocket that went directly to the moon. We were not going to do lunar orbit rendezvous. But through that process, we determined we had to do this rendezvous around the moon to avoid having to build this huge, big spacecraft like the Russians were building with their N1 rocket. Yep. So again, specifying those requirements or keeping the policy very general and very broad or really defining what you really want to occur and not how to make it occur is extremely important. But I think in today's world, it's so tempting because you can do the analysis and you can do the runs that you want to go specify, I want a vehicle that does this kind of capability with this lift capability, or I want this particular vehicle. I think you need to step back and say, what is the problem you're trying to solve? And then open it up to the world or open it up to the resource or open it up to the team to figure out how to solve that problem. We've got a, a lot of uh, young folks in the room and many more on, online. Um, when thinking about uh, teamwork opportunities in, in the workplace, what advice would you have for that generation to, to best prepare them for the workforce environment? And, and how do we uh, uh, benefit from this team, teamwork environment for, for to get the necessary progress for space exploration? I think what I described before is don't ever underestimate what you can contribute. You know, you need to know your strengths, you need to know your weaknesses, and, and look at the team and look at what the team needs and how can you contribute to that team. But do not discount what you bring to the table. If it's communications and maybe English language skills to write things, right? You may be able to give better speeches than I can give, right? Then fine, take those and, and figure out how you can contribute to the team effort moving forward. And, and, but don't discount what you can bring. And don't think just because I haven't been through this formal process or I didn't get this degree or I didn't take these classes, I don't have the capability. Don't discount that. You can learn and just immerse yourself Put yourself wholeheartedly in, and, and you, I think you'll be surprised at what you can accomplish. And the satisfaction that coming from knowing that you help this team in a small way is, is just phenomenal. And that's what I love about the challenges we choose here. There, like I said in my remarks, again, we can't accomplish this on our own. There's no one human being that can do any of this stuff. It absolutely takes all of us to work together. And that's what I see the real beauty is. So do not discount what you can bring to the table. I guarantee every one of the students here and, and those online, you've got something you can contribute and you can really make us a leader and be innovative and creative in ways that, that we couldn't imagine. So I, I look, I've, I have that optimism that the challenge is there and I'm looking to you to help, help us solve that challenge. So we only have a few minutes left and there's a flood of questions still in the chat. Um, but this last question um, has been upvoted the most out of any of them. Uh, but before we ask that, I, I do want to say this has been an absolute pleasure hosting you up here. Uh, I could probably sit up here forever and, and talk to you. Just your experience, even at lunch, has just been, uh, the stories you have to share have been, been amazing. But um, what everyone else in the audience wants to know is, um, what are goldfish moments? And give us an example of your top goldfish moment. Yeah, okay, so, so goldfish moments came about when I was 
I became space station program manager, and the program manager before me was Tommy Holloway, and he had all these um, high, lofty sayings and grandiose, wonderful things, and so that's not me. So I got a Far Side cartoon once, and there's these, these soldiers, and they're attacking this moat in this Far Side cartoon, and they're running across this bridge, and there's all these guys up on the on the fortress, and they're all shooting arrows at these folks running across the bridge. And one of the soldiers running across the bridge looks down in the moat, and they, and they go, ooh, goldfish. And, and that's where the goldfish moments came from. So when we were in the middle of the, the audit in, I think, 2000 or 2001, and Space Station was about ready to be canceled, and the auditors are just grilling us to death, I would look at my team, and I would wink at them, and I would go, goldfish. And it was kind of our secret code word that there was some little moment that was really good and really special that only you could appreciate. So, so when your, you know, your CFD code closes and it works for the first time and you've been trying to get it to run for months, that's a goldfish moment. No one else will appreciate that. No, will under, no one else will understand it. You'll be in the middle of this war. You'll be in the middle of this challenge. But those little things, those little nuggets, those things that only you can appreciate, you just remember those and go, ooh, goldfish. And you'll know what that means. <laughs> That's an awesome story. Thank you very much, Bill. Well, I hope uh, all of you enjoyed today's Durand Lecture, again, sponsored by uh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, their generous support of this lecture has, has been greatly appreciated for a number of years. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and enjoy the rest of the week at the AAA SciTech Forum. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you.